Turn your Bibles this morning to 1 Chronicles chapter 15. It'll be a while before we get there, and my message is kind of drawn out a little bit, stretched out at different places because of the storyline takes a span of about 20, 50 years or so type thing. And so once you find Second Chron- First Chronicles, put a bookmark at chapter 15. And then turn to Second Samuel chapter 6. And again, grab a bookmark. And it'll be a little closer to when we get there. Second Samuel chapter 6. And then our story begins in 1 Samuel chapter 6. You can pray with your eyes open if you're still looking. Father, we just thank you for today. And God, we want to dedicate this time to you. Holy Spirit, would you come in your power, your revelation today. God, we are your people, and we ask that you would reveal truth to us, life to us, instruction and righteousness, if we need discipline, if we need correction, God, you are our Father. And because of that, you love us. And today in this message, I pray, God, that you would communicate to our heart what we need to hear in the face of 2021. At the ending of 2020, and where our eyesight's a little better looking back, But we look to you, and Father, we just thank you that you are in control of our lives. And today, again, we want to rededicate our hearts, our lives, our ambitions, our passions to you. In Jesus' name, amen. This, in in a sense, isn't a new message because um, years ago when I came across some of the truths that I have preached down through the years, I've preached some of these principles a lot about the life of Obed-Eden. But as I was reading through this section, and and, uh, I just felt like there's a, a message in here I had not seen before in the life of the story of this happening that I want to share with you concerning a heart for God's presence. Having a heart for the presence of God, not just doing church, not going through the motions, but literally having my heart involved with who and why we do what we do. And so we pick up our storyline, if you know, out of um, the book of First and Second Samuel. I like these books because they're easy to read. They're story ty- type things, and there's a lot of fighting and killing and stuff like that. And <laughs> <laughs> if I was making a movie, man, these are the ones I'd pick. And, and God went out and slaughtered them all, and it's just life was happy now. And... Uh, <laughs> Israel had sinned, and because of that, God's presence pulled back from them. I should say that they walked out from his umbrella of protection. And they went into battle, and they lost the Ark of the Covenant because they took their good luck charm with battle, and it wasn't a good luck charm that was helping them. It was the presence of God. And in that battle... um, they lost the Ark of the Covenant, and the Philistines had it for a spell. I just love the whole storyline of what, how God devastated their gods, little g, obviously. And, and, and they couldn't handle having the presence of God, so they sent the Ark back home. Okay, and they sent it to one town. They go, don't send it to us. And so they sent it on back to Israel. And, and when it got to Israel is where we pick up our story. Um, and, and so starting in 1 Samuel chapter 6, let's look at verse 21. So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kedjerim, saying, The Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down now and take it up with you. The men of Kedjerim came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on a hill and consecrated Eliezer, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. So it was that the ark remained at Kirjith jerim for a long time. It was there 20 years that all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. That last part, that last sentence, basically all the house of Israel is saying, we want God's presence back where it should be. And so now let's pick up our storyline back into 2 Samuel chapter 6. 
During that time, Saul died, Samuel died, David came to reign. And David is now king and desires to have God's presence at the center of where it should be, back in Jerusalem. And so in 2 chapter, Second Samuel chapter 6, and I turn to first, Second Chronicles, we need 2 Samuel chapter 6. Let's start with verse 1. David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Beth Baal, Judah, to bring from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubs. And they set the ark of the God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on a hill, and Uzzah and Ohio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart, and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on a hill accompanying the ark of God, and Ohio went before the ark. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord, and all kinds of instruments, and woodwinds, and harps, and stringed instruments on tambourines, and, and it, it wasn't a quiet parade, okay? It was pretty boisterous. Verse 6, and when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark and took a hold of it, for the oxen had stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died by the ark of God. And David became angry because the Lord had outbroke against Uzzah and called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of God come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him out of the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obed-Eden the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Eden. Eden the Gittite for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed Eden and his household, all his household. Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord blessed the house of Obed Eden and all that belongs to him because the ark of God. So David went and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed Eden to the city of David with gladness. Embedded in here, you can find this in First Chronicles. First Chronicles um, retells the story, and it just gives little bits and details. During that three-month period, David, I think, was researching. Okay, God, how should we move the ark? We did it our way, and it didn't work. How should we do it? And so David went back, and he began to research, and he found the Levitical ordinances for handling the ark of the covenant. And so, following those, David came came back to the house of Obed-Eden and got the ark. Verse 13, So it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. The way that God intended the ark to be moved was on the shoulders of the priesthood. Man, that'll preach. There's, there's so many ways I want to go with this, but I don't have time. God had never intended for people to handle his presence, but he told them how to respond to his presence. The Ark of the Covenant was a square box that had four rings on it, one on each corner, and they would take these long poles and they would insert those into the rings so they didn't just pick the box up, they didn't just handle it, it was a specific way that it had to be handled. So they would insert those poles into those rings and on the count of four, they would all lift it up and put it on their shoulders. Had they done this Uzzah would not have died because the oxen wouldn't have stumbled and they lost foothold and all that. And so they, we find here that David did it according to the way God had instructed. Verse 14, Then David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod, which is interesting because David wasn't a priest, and yet he was. He was a king priest. He was a worshiping priest. He was a priest like none other before him. Man, I wish I could go into this. This is just, you need to get into this book on your own. There's just so many good stuff. This is Everlasting Gobstopper again. 
Verse 15, so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpets. And the ark of the Lord came into the city of David. Michael the Saul's daughter looked through a window and saw David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she was despised him in her heart. I think there were some other things going on there too. But And so they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. I'm going to stop there. As you read this story, down through the years, um, as I read this story, I just like, why did God kill Azza? It seemed like such an innocent thing that took place here. You know, all he was doing, he was trying to protect the ark of God. But what we need to hear and embedded in the text, and as I do some other research, Uzzah wasn't just an, one guy. They say, we need someone to help take the ark covenant to the... He wasn't just some Joe that they grabbed to, to accompany the ark. If you look in our text that we've already read, Uzzah was the son of Abinadab. Abinadab was where the Ark of the Covenant went to stay after the Philistines brought it back. He brought it into his house, and he had three sons that we know of. Eliezer, they consecrated to be a priest before and operate and function with the Ark of God and minister to it. We have Ohio that drove the cart, and then Uzzah that was going alongside accompanying. And so what we have here is a family of Abinadab that had housed the ark for 20 years. So Uzzah was not just an innocent bystander that was struck dead. As you study this and look at this, the Ark of the Covenant had been in their home for 20 years. Uzzah would have been accustomed to being around the Ark of the Covenant. And Abinadab was a Levite. And because of that, Uzzah was a Levite. And being a Levite, he should have been uh, um, understanding of the Levitical customs. In verse 7, it says that God struck him for his error. If you read this in the NIV and you read this in the, New, in the Amplified Bible, the New American Standard Bible, it says God struck him because of his irreverence. NIV, his irreverent act. Okay? He was familiar with routine around the ark, but he missed the relationship that should have been there with the ark. To me, Uzzah, being a Levite, should have been familiar with the Levitical ordinances concerning how to handle the ark. That was his heritage. That was his family. That's the reason the Levites lived, were to cater to the presence of God. And the Levitical ordinances were there to give strict reverence to why they did what they did. And I just submit to you, I don't know this, but I think Uzzah was just doing his thing and not maintaining the reverence that should have been attached to why he was doing what he's doing. I want to apply that in again in, in just a little bit as we a little bit later on. But it appears his familiarity with being around the ark might have caused him to view the ark as just something he was doing rather than something that is sacred. And if I don't tie this into your daily lives, what God has called you to do is sacred. I can't lose the fact that I have been called to do my daily life. I have to remind myself every once in a while, I have been appointed by God with a sacred duty of ministering to my family, my granddaughters. And sometimes it's a hassle, and sometimes I don't like it. But if I lose track of the fact that what I do is sacred, I am just walking through the paces of life. And I just submit to you, that's one of the many reasons why I think God said, enough. God needed to get attention of a king that might have just brought the presence of God in and said, there we go. 
But instead, David dropped back, and for three months, he said, God, what do I do? God, what do I do? And God reminded him that this is a sacred thing. Serving God is not just a title. It's a lifestyle, and it's just not that. It's a heart responding to a king of kings. So as I read the story And down through the years, I think this storyline takes a turn at the as the introduced to life, verse ten, the life of the life of Obed Eden. We read this story so casually. They took the ark and they put it in the home of Obed Eden, and then three months later they came and got the ark and took it back to Israel, to Jerusalem. Excuse me. But we read that so casual, but. Had you been there on the spot, I would love to have been at the home of Obed Eden that night after the kids went to bed and Mrs. Eden talked to Obed. How did you allow the king to talk you into bringing that into our home? Do you realize what you've done? It just killed a guy just for touching it. What if one of the kids come by and bump into it? What do you think you were doing? And, and you know, just the casualness, we read that and it happens. But bringing the Ark of the Covenant into his home was a critical movement. But you see in the life of Obed Eden, from the view the Bible gives us, there was a turning point from the moment that Obed Eden brought the Ark of the Covenant into his home, his life changed and it began to be blessed by God so much so everybody said man what's going on over at the house of Obed Eden he's being blessed and blessed and blessed it was so much blessing that the word got back to the king do you realize what's happening at the house of Obed Eden because of the ark of the covenants in the center of his home his home is blessed and I just present to you you want to have a blessed home get God in the center if I have God in the center of my home, my home's going to be blessed. I just That's such a powerful message. And, 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 and having God at the center is so critical. But this morning, I want to look at the contrast that I saw for the first time between the house of Abinadab and the house of Obed-Eden. Obinadab and his sons, Eliezer, Uzzah, and Ohio, had the same opportunities that Obed-Eden had. They had a nightlight when no one else did. Okay? You'd walk by Obed Eden's house or Abinadab's house at night, and there was something going on in the windows. And, and Mrs. Eden had to sleep with a mask over it because no one was used to nightlights. But the Shekinah of God dwelt between the cherubs on the Ark of the Covenant. If it still happened that way, and it appears that that didn't change just because it lost to the Philistines. But there was a presence that accompanied the Ark that changed the life of Obed-Eden that didn't seem to impact the house of Abinadab. And as I was reading this, it just said, Gary... Pay attention to how you handle the holy things. It appears that when King David took the ark of Obed Eden, or the ark to the home of Obed Eden, when David went to get it and bring it to Jerusalem, from the next scriptures that we're going to read, it looks like when David went and got the ark from the house of Obed-Eden and brought it to the place in Jerusalem where he had made it, that Obed-Eden went with it. Now let's turn to Second Chronicles. First Chronicles, thank you. And for some reason I didn't give you the verses. So, what do I want? I mean, it's all good but there's specific verses I want to look at. Hmm. 16.1 will work. Yeah, that's actually what I want. So they brought the house of the God and set it in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. And they offered burnt offerings and the peace offerings before God. I'm in 1 Chronicles 16.1. Verse 2 
And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord and distributed to every one of Israel, both men and women, to every one a loaf of bread. There we go. Skip down to verse 4. And they appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord and committed to uh, um, to com- to commemorate, to thank and praise God of Israel, basically 24-7. David set it up so the Levites, 24-7, day and night, all through the night, they would worship God around the ark. Verse 5, Asa, the chief, we'll get to that in a moment, and next to him, Zechariah and Jeruel, Shemeth guy, another guy, and a little bit, and, many, and then notice the word Obed Eden. What I get from this is if you uh, um, read uh, uh, chapter 15, you will see Obed Eden's name here and here and here and here. As David brought the ark and set it in place, he said, I need somebody to um, worship before the Lord. Obed Eden's hand went up. I can do that. I'll do, I'll do that. And then I need someone to be a gatekeeper. I'll, I'll be the gatekeeper. And I need someone to uh, play music. I'll, I'll, do, I'll, be, I'll do that. And, and so you see from chapter 15 and all the way through chapter 16, it looks as if when David brought the Ark of the Covenant that Obed and Mrs. Eden had previously had a ta- uh, conversation, said, you know, life's not been the same since God was in our house. There's going to come a day that David's going to come get this ark. I can't stand to be without that presence. And so Obed made a choice to go with the ark and his family moved to Jerusalem. They were living in blessings that were so unprecedented. It just began for three months. It began to be extreme. But Obed Eden wasn't after the blessings. He was after the presence that brought the blessings, right? And I'm sure that Obed loved the blessings, but it was the presence, not just not God's stuff. He desired for the Lord. His desire for him was so that he would be close to God, whatever it took. God, I want to minister to you. I am not ministering to David. I am not ministering to the church. I am ministering to you. And everything that Obed Eden did flowed out of the fact that he recognized the presence of God was there. And when you operate in that, you recognize your ministry in life has a deeper meaning. I want to go back to what uh, Margot's message was in that thing. She talked about the maker of the manger that Jesus laid in. He did not realize the sacred thing he was doing with ordinary day living. And yet from scripture we find that Whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your might as unto the Lord. And when you recognize that, your passion for life flows out of the presence that you're involved in. It's not because I do this because I get God's blessing. I get God's blessing because I do this. And I just present to you, Obed Eden had a heart for God. And because of that, he became a gatekeeper. He became a musician. He became a doorkeeper. You can look in my notes or read this chapter on your own. Obed Eden becomes a worship leader and is mentioned alongside Asaph, who was one of the cheap musicians. And as you look at Psalms, you read the, a lot of the Psalms were written by Asaph. And a lot of, in the chapter uh, um, 16, Asaph gave David a song and David had the musicians sing it before the Lord because Asaph was an anointed chief worship leader. Obed-Eden was right there with him. Why? Because he wasn't willing to let the ark leave. He recognized that being in the presence of God was what was, was critical his desire for a relationship established also brought for him and his children and his grandchildren. He developed a relationship with God himself, but it impacted his family and 
when I have God at the center of my home, when I learn to worship God at home with my kids, I give them relationship. I give my grandchildren relationship. We don't know where it all started with him. But it appears that when he put God in the center of his living room, life changed. As I was reading this, I was thinking about 2021. What can I do to transition? Obed-Eden didn't wait for God to tell him what to do. He just did what it meant to wait on God. And out of that, hmm, so many times people are waiting for God to call them into a position. And yet, Bill Johnson, for instance, is, is one of the top leading spiritual leaders that I know. I have a bunch of, them, bunch of them that I would put in that category. But he says, you know, God's never called him to be a pastor or into the ministry. He just worshiped God, got in love with God, and when he saw something needed done, he did it as unto the Lord. And consequently, God made room for these gifts that he has. And I believe that every one of us need to live in that same place. And so a relationship with God causes me to do things as unto the Lord. Abinadab and his son Eliezer, uh, Uzzah and Ohio, all had the same opportunity that, that Obed-Eden had. But they went back home. When the ark moved, they went home. They mourned the loss of Uzzah, but have you ever heard the phrase, familiarity brings contempt? I wonder if Uzzah and his family had become so familiar with the ark that they didn't maintain the relationship that Obed-Eden and his family did. Same access to the ark. Yet Obed-Eden said, I can't live without it. Abinadab and his house seems to go back to normal. There's a minister that I, I got to hear, Dick Iverson. He was a founding pastor of Bible Temple in, in Oregon. And, and uh, uh, years ago, we used to have shepherd's conferences. They still have them, but they've kind of changed the face of how they do things. But he was one of our key speakers and, and uh, just an incredible man. God used him in a lot of ways in Portland area. And, and uh, um, I, I've never got to go to that church, but I wanted to for years just because uh, um, they move in the presence of God a lot. There are others in Portland too, but uh, um, I'm familiar with this one. And, and, and he was a powerful man of God. And he said early on in his ministry, he got to be one of the workers at the Catherine Kuhlman Crusades. He was one, if you remember Catherine Kuhlman, don't know about her, God used her in an incredible way to do miracles. I mean, unheard of mir miracles after miracles. I'll just tell you one of them. There was a black man that uh, um, was having a heart problem, so they put a pacemaker. You remember the old pacemakers? They stuck out about, you know, you know, looked like a fist sticking on the side of their chest. And he went to a Catherine Kuhlman uh, um, crusade, and miracles were normal there. Or, or ex I mean, they just happened all the time. He didn't even get to go up. He didn't even go get prayed for. He was just there. And he, uh, the day, day or two later, he went to his doctor and he hadn't even noticed the whole thing was gone. And the doctor said, who's been messing with my patient? And he, and he ran him through the ringers, couldn't even find the scar because God had so dramatically removed the pacemaker and healed his heart. Those were the normal things. Well, during this, Catherine Kuhlman, I think it was Catherine Kuhlman, I can't remember for sure. Anyway, he was one of the people that would help the sick people off the floor, up onto the stage to go get prayed for. And he said at first, he would, he would just with tears streaming down his arm, he would help these sick people up and watch God heal them and they wouldn't hardly have to help them get off the stage. They'd be jumping and running off the stage and, and just miracle after miracle. But after a few months of this, he got to, to, to being familiar with his job and it was frustrating and he found his heart alienating from being excited what God was doing. He was just saying, come on, hurry up, get up there, set the people in line. And he was frustrated with the very people he was helping to minister. And I think sometimes as we walk through the paces of our relationship with God, we come so familiar with the presence that we forget that it's a sacred thing. How does all this come out in our attitudes towards God? Well, I've gone to church all my life. 
I'm good at it. I, I know how. I know what to expect. And sometimes it becomes so familiar that I forget that it's really sacred. And on a given Sunday, given my attitude as I come into church, I'm just going, I don't know. Should I come or not? I don't, I don't know. I'm busy. I don't know if I want to go or not. And I just present to you, God is saying to me, as I read through that, and I recognize and realize that the house of Benadab, how they responded to the presence of God was different than Obed-Eden. I want to be like the house of Obed-Eden. I want my children and my children's children to be set up for life because of my response to God is sacred. So that what I do on a Sunday morning, I don't take for granted. But when I come in here and I get the opportunity to worship together with you, there's something that flows out of me that's from life and not religion. Our society is up to here in people that do religious activity on a Sunday morning and live whatever the way they want the rest of the week. And it's a stench in the nostrils of people who don't know God. And they are rightly saying, they're no better than I am. And I think it comes down to this. When I don't hold sacred the things that God calls me to, I become familiar with it. And then I come complacent. And then sometimes it's just an irritating thing. What I hear God saying to Faith Chapel is don't get so familiar with doing church that I miss the relationship that Obed-Eden had. And how much a greater chance do I have today than him where I have the Holy Spirit on board? Hmm. The instructions to the children of Israel were, when you see the Ark of the Covenant starting to move, you move with it. You leave the place of familiar and go where the ark is leading you. And sometimes we say, this is the way I want life to be. And instead of following the ark, instead of recognizing the sacredness of following the presence of God, we expect God to be fit into my lifestyle. And that's just opposite of what it means to be a Christian. As a Christian, I don't fit God into my lifestyle. God is my lifestyle. If I have time for other things, I fit those in, but I have to have my priorities straight. My relationship with God is ultimate. When I have God at the center of my home, the center of my life, it's different. When I worship him, it's not just a song. It's got to come from a place of reverence and sacredness. As I put God at the place in the center, I feel like God is saying, don't become familiar to the place of irreverence. Man, this speaks loudly to me. I was, I was raised in church. Most of the hymns we can sing, I can sing without a, a book. I can quote scripture. And sometimes I've gone and done church so much, it just becomes so familiar. But God is saying this year, as you walk through 2021, make sure the sacred things are sacred. Put God in the center of your life. Don't just do routine. Do Christ. Understand the sacred things that your hands touch. Various of you, God has put all over our city and you think you're just walking through mundane normal and sometimes it's so familiar I almost get anxious or frustrated at God because... And God is saying, remember the holy. You're anointed for such a time as this. Don't forget to work as unto God. I'd like you to bow your heart with me in prayer. Father, this morning, all of us, as I look around the room, all of us can fall into this category of being familiar with the holy. God, today as we, not just a transition of one year to another, but because we're in your presence and your Holy Spirit touches us. God, we want more of your presence. 
Let us experience what the heart of Obed Eden experienced to the place. He didn't just stay with the blessings. They were nice, but that wasn't what he was after. He was after the presence. God, today, I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict us of the times that we've been so familiar with the holy that we just take it for granted. Forgive us the times, God, where our hearts don't recognize the intensity of what you've called us to do. So, Father, today I pray that as we're in your presence, that we would recommit to the reason that we live to be for you. Regardless of whether we're still working for a living or we're retired or... God, any category that we fall into today, God, I pray that we would recommit our hearts, our lives to the Holy God. We don't want to just fit you into our being, our life. We want our life to revolve around you. (laughs) Yes, God. God, today we just pray over our lives. The life of this congregation. That we wouldn't do church, that we would be. Your presence poured out to a community of people that need real life. Seely Lake doesn't need church goers, it needs the church to be alive with living water. Pour out your rain in our lives. God, I pray for the person, every person in this room, that it would begin to rain so much in their life that the people around them can come and drink. The people around them can know there's life that comes from the throne. God, help us if we have been like us, uh, used to your presence. And help us to be more like Obed Eden. And sacrifice it all to be in your presence. I just declare God's blessing over your people today. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Can I encourage you not to make a New Year's resolution, but to make a commitment to God saying, I want all that I've ever had in the past to be nothing compared to what you're giving me today. This day, I pursue you with life. I pursue your heart. I don't want to be the one that say, you know, the hardest people to train are the ones that already know it. I want to be that wide-eyed, innocent child that say, yes, God. Yes, God. So this year, as you approach 2021, approach it with that passion and say, God, all that I have is yours. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great Sunday. A great 2021.